Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. Book publishers tend to shy away from collections of short stories because they don't sell as well as novels and they rarely provide material for television or the movies. But Laura Stapleton, a lecturer in the English department at the Borough Manhattan Community College, is undeterred. Her new collection of short pieces runs a gamut from traditional short stories to essays and even journal style writing. What's the purpose of the short story as compared to that of the novel? And where can short story writers go to get their work published these days? The Ruin of Everything Stories is published by Paloma Press. Welcome. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. You know, as, as I said, short story collections are sort of the stepchildren of the book publishing world. Yes. Uh, publishers resist them, I think they, they much prefer that authors bring them novels or uh, nonfiction books. But you've chosen the short story format, why? The part of it is that I enjoy them. I wrote a short story collection when I was in graduate school in the mid 90s and I published it in the late 90s. And that's kind of normal that graduates, that young writers write a lot of short stories as they're learning. And um, I don't know, I really don't know why I didn't um, kind of decide on a novel after that. I wanted to try a lot of different things and I just kept writing short stories. I um, uh, worked on some television ideas for a while. And um, it's, it's really, I, I don't know why I didn't decide to write a novel. I've just started one now. Um, but I, I think probably a lot of it has to do with um, the lifestyle that I was living. So I was an adjunct for a very long time and we all know um, what, how hard that work is. And I was working on a bunch of different campuses and um, working very hard and um, they fit in better with my lifestyle, I think, at that point. What's, what would you say is the goal of a short story as opposed to that of a novel? It's more of a complete experience. Um, they're read more often in one sitting. Um, this, probably my favorite short stories that I've read were by Edgar Allan Poe. And he, his worlds in those stories are just so amazingly whole. And um, they're, they're um, slices of larger stories and um, they have a finality that novels don't have. Several of the stories in your book read like traditional short stories. Yes. So there is a clear structure mm -hmm. and perhaps a denouement or rounded or rounding off at the end. I think you describe this as a sort of quiet epiphany. Mm -hmm. which one looks for in, in, in short stories. Others seem to be comprised of disparate parts and then, I don't know, sort of stop. Tell me about that. I'm really interested in experiments and structure. There, short stories have had a very conservative form compared to other literary forms. Um, poets write anything. They have a thousand different forms, of the, a thousand, an infinite amount of different forms that they use. Um, and then the, there have been a lot of experiments in the novel and there have been less in short stories. Um, and, and I really just enjoy them. I like kind of reminding the reader a little bit that there's artifice in what they're experiencing. Uh, a big influence on me when I was coming of age as a writer was actually a playwright named uh, Maria, Maria Irene Forness. Um, and sh her structures were very um, experimental. And she, one of my favorite things that she did is she had a play where um, the, the stage directions asked the actress to drop their characters between scenes and they would um, help move the, uh, the furniture and the, help s set up the stage. So the audience would be reminded between these scenes that they were watching actors. And it was a really high priority um, when I was in graduate school um, that stories um, that stories attempt a realness. I don't know if they ever achieve realness, right? Because it's always artifice. Um, and to me, it's much more important that it be interesting. And um, that there's there's a a, a very strong. Um, tradition of kind of an inverted checkmark structure that was um, that is maybe the the um, the 
grandchild of, of a, a Hemingway story. And again, um, I, like, I like to just try all kinds of different things. When I was in graduate school, mm -hmm. I got to write stories and taking mm -hmm. classes in um, creative writing, I remember declaring with great confidence that the purpose of all art is revelation. Mm. To, re to help the reader see something or understand something that he or she may not have seen or understood before. Mm -hmm. um, as, again, that quiet epiphany that you talk about. Um, do you agree that the purpose of art is revelation? And is that what you try to accomplish in your story? That's interesting. Um, yes, I think that's a great word, revelation. I mean, I think that's what I feel when I like art the most. Right, that it, it, it feels like something that I've both known all along and is fantastically new at the same time. And um, if I could give readers an experience like that, that would make me very happy. But yes, but yes, I would agree that, that uh, art is revelation. Yes. In your story, Alpha Male, the first, uh, the first story in the collection, you give us some insight into how the ego, the personality, the mm -hmm. sexual behavior of a male movie star mm -hmm. are formed. Was that your goal in that story? I think, I think I'm very interested in people who ruin their own lives. Um, in, um, Ruining their own lives? Yes, or at least in okay. some way. And, that, and the, the title, The Ruin of Everything, refers to a, a quality that I think almost all of my main characters have, um, they all find themselves kind of destroyed by the end of a relationship. And they all see the end of that relationship as kind of um, inevitable because of some childhood trauma, right? We, we get little hints of, of the way that they became very wounded people. Um, as the writer, as the person constructing these stories, I see um, their fear more as the driving factor in the destruction of their relationships. And, and this is something that, I, that um, they don't understand. Okay. Is that true as well in, in the, the second sort of traditional story, Intention yeah. Black, where you uh, write about how a quiet, studious daughter of immigrant parents yeah. evolves socially and in her career choices? I think that, um, that's, prob that's probably the one story that, it, that has less of that quality, right? But for her, that family is kind of ruined by the story of their, of their economic struggle, right? So the, the mother abandons her first child um, in order to come to the United States, and he's kind of ruined by it. And then he's kind of this, he, he's this, um, this form that, that lives in their household, um, that has a lot of heaviness that scares them. And um, the main character, her quiet studiousness, um, her ambition, which is what she turns to at the end of the story, comes after she's, she's on the edge of happiness and she's on the edge of being a, a conscious person, both in terms of, um, of the, the injustice of the world and her, and her own... Um, awareness of self. She's on the edge of a kind of happiness. And then when she sees her brother destroyed, she gives up that happiness too. And she becomes, she relies totally on her idea of, um, of ambition and, and assimilation. So I see her as, she's, she's, she does have a ruin, but it's in a slightly different way. Other, others won't see it, right? She's, um, she's, she's lost a truth to herself, is the way that I see it. All of your characters' lives are pretty messy. And mm -hmm. I guess because most people's lives are sure. pretty messy. Sure. Um, what were you trying to say? What, one story that I found mm -hmm. being was Godspeed, which mm -hmm. is about uh, a woman coming to the realization that her lover no longer loves her, set against the story of a teenage boy who gets arrested <laughs> outside of a home for pregnant teens. Yeah. I assume he's in love with one of the teenage girls inside. Yes. Uh, what were you trying to get at there? And why these two particular stories? I'm not sure that he doesn't love her. Um, it, that might be. And it also might be that the, the boyfriend at the end, when she comes to that realization, 
it it might be that he doesn't it might be that he doesn't love her anymore and it might be that she decides he doesn't love her anymore and even if he doesn't love her anymore it it comes from her kind of obsessive fear that he won't is one way i'll say it and then i think her watching the spectacle of the of the um of the young man uh, coming to the to the home for pregnant girls is that um is that there's such pure love in the action of um of there's something shakespearean in that in that scene you know of of some of the some romeo and juliet of this young man coming to look for his um for his love and they're and they're so young right and i think that she just um she envies the pure the purity of purity. of that of those feelings that certainly he's demonstrating and and um right here right now as a reader and writer i like to imagine the the girlfriend is too right so the story flesh and blood he reads more like an essay than a short story yes uh, you talk about your different approaches to writing about which parts of your physical body certain emotions seem to emanate from <laughs> you talk about your experience of living through the pandemic mm -hmm. about a kind of, I guess, psychological breakdown that you experienced mm -hmm. at that time. And you talk about your breakup with Tommy, this mm -hmm. woman who is, has this affair with Tommy is a recurring character in a number of your mm -hmm. um, stories. What were you trying to get at in, in that piece? Um, I see it as a very essayistic story. And the woman has a lot in common with me, but she also does not. So, so I do see her as a character. I was kind of having fun with naming her after me, although it's also, it's dark. It's a, it, all my stories are kind of dark, but I've also learned, people are telling me that it's funny, that they're funny too, and I'm glad that they are, but I, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but um, I, let's see, the way that I see that story, that's the one story in which a character has um has optimism at the end and i'm not sure that she's not fooling herself right that she's she's been through this breakup again they're they're mostly about breakups and um she she actually seems that she can kind of will herself quickly to a healing and it might be temporary it might not be true but um that that kind of will of the heart um interests me right and also the physicality of emotions and even cognition are really interesting to me um that you know just as as a, as kind of a sidebar it took me a while to learn that i would get really tired from correcting papers a lot right i thought because in my young years i had waited tables and i was a bartender i thought teaching would be less draining because that was such hard physical work um and then it, then it came well, to me no <laughs> thinking very hard is very difficult right thinking concentrating hour after hour is very hard on us right and there, and it's also a physical act so i'm i'm interested in how all of this all, all of this is of the body right and we and we we separate it in some ways but all that thinking comes inside our body too in our in our emotions right so so i'm i'm interested in that discussion well, in decades past, when I was sending mailing out short stories and yeah. collecting rejection slips, there were a lot of, I guess you call little literary magazines where short story writers would hope to get their first uh, stories published. I, I remember mm -hmm. Sawani Review was one. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the names of some of the others. Do magazines like that still exist? And is that where uh, short story writers generally get their first hits I mean, after, after their college yeah, year or yeah, absolutely yes absolutely i have you know when i was very young and with my first collection i sent out stories constantly and and i would send them out a hundred times i was just very resolute about it and, and i'm not as much anymore um uh but i should be right um but yes that is where that is where new writers can get their can get their work published and it's it's exciting to see to see work. The, is there any place on the internet for short fiction? Oh, sure. Um, I am not good about naming those right off the top of my head, but absolutely. What I, what I do when it comes time to send out short stories is I open up Best American Short Stories and the Pushcart Prizes, and I just look at the magazines that they refer to okay. right, and make myself some lists and, and tool around looking at them. I guess the, the big 
prizes at the time mm -hmm. were, that I was going along was the Atlantic. I mean, if you've got an Atlantic, oh, yeah. first, that was really something. Absolutely. Uh, and the, uh, the New Yorker, are they still the big prizes? Yes, as far as I know. I worry that I that I, I don't have my um, that I I don't know what's going on in the culture out there as as much as I did when I was younger, right? But I I believe so. Yes. Who are some of the writers who have influenced you? Um, for in the short story form in the, in the last few years, um, I really liked Roberta Bolaño's stories. Um, his stories are just very free. They're like character sketches. You know, he refers to all kinds of texts in them. Um, to uses films. He uses um, uh, conferences. Um, he they're they're just very free. They read almost like kind, they read like experiments, and and I really like that. I like that feeling as a writer. Um, I read a couple of books this year. I'll say this year because they're influencing me the way that I think about literature right now. And two books that I loved because of their structures were um, Whereabouts by Jhumpa Lahiri, which was really interesting because she wrote it in Italian. And um, it's, it's just a very unique book. And it's about a woman who is an academic who's kind of uh, wandering around an Italian city, a little bit lonely. And then the ship, there's shifts, there's shifts in her, and they're and they're very subtle, right? You 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 might uh, miss them if you're not really paying attention, but it, it it kind of suggests a happy ending. It's very subtle that comes from her internal shifts, but um, uh, it just a really uniquely structured book. And the other book that I really loved this year that I read was um, Radiance of the King, and um, I'm by Kamara Laye, and um, and I found that book because Toni Morrison wrote about him, and um, it's uh, she seemed to think of it as the great post-colonial novel, and um, it's the structure is just so unique, and um, it has it has this ending that makes you go back and reinterpret everything you've read, and and I just love that. I thought it was a really exciting book. What's your you want to say something about your writing process? Um, sure. Uh, I like walking around by myself um, a lot and just seeing what comes to me. Um, I don't always have time to do that, right? Or, or it's not always possible because if I walk too much, I'll get too tired on top of the teaching, right? So um, sometimes I just have to sit. But I really enjoy kind of being visited by my stories. If I, if I the way that I have to try is to be quiet and still myself and be aware of my thoughts. But if I kind of try too hard, if I, if I, if I say, I'll try this and I'll make this happen, um, I think it's not as interesting. So that's something that I do have in common with the character from Flesh and Blood. I, I describe this character's writing process and, and I share a lot I've with I've heard it. a lot of people in uh, creative writing classes talk about how when you create a character mm -hmm. and then you let, you, you let the character, you follow the character, that the character takes you to where the story should go. And my, my question has always been, well, suppose the, the, the character goes into the store and doesn't come out. I mean, which is what happened to me, you know? <laughs> uh, and I wonder if what they're really talking about when they're saying that is not you follow the character, but we're really talking about imagination. I don't know. That's what? interesting, but I'm, I'm fascinated by the character who goes into the store and doesn't come out. What's happened in there, right? You could be, a, you could be the, the, the friend or the family member waiting outside and something, and it's a perfectly normal day and something starts to descend, some darkness starts to descend from that moment. But anyway, um, yeah. It, I it, make I, a mystery story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, the... See, yeah, that I, I would say they're they're talking about a kind of imagination that um, I like. I like the feeling of following the imagination, right? Um, that my my favorite thing to write about is dreams. Right? I love to to wake up and record my dreams. They're just so um, they're so precise and they're so um, and clear and complicated. Right? What can be learned about creative writing in a community college? Oh, that's interesting. The, the same things that are 
that are learned in, you know, in any academic institution. Um, I just think that young writers should just experiment and try everything, right? When I teach creative writing at BMCC, um, I have my students just try a bunch of different forms and also try a lot of different ways to write. So I think it's interesting for myself and them to talk about all the various ways that people write because we're all so different, right? People have different systems. So I tell them famous writer systems that I know of. I tell them my friend system, I tell them mine and they, and they find their own way. But I think the most important thing is just to, to sit down and do it. And, um, and also to read a lot, right? That, um, that good, good writers are good readers. So it's important to kind of know about literature. Has all the emphasis on the internet and social media had an impact on the ability of young people to write? I think so. I think so. Uh, a good <laughs> impact or a bad impact? Um, probably more. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is a positive impact in that they'll be writing in new forms. Um, uh, I know that I'm more distracted and I wish I wasn't. And I wish that I, I wish that um, my students could experience that life before um, smartphones. Um, because there's something about that that I really miss, a kind of purity of thought and a centeredness. And, um, and I'm always wrestling with myself about um, my own uh, struggle with social media and, um, and uh, 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 the stillness that I need to write the way that I, that I want to write. For example, American, not American, worldwide um, episodic using, viewing television is so much better than when, than when I was young, right? It's, it's so, um, there's so much good writing going on all over the world. It's really exciting and it's such a fun art form. So I think that technology, a lot of good writers are going into that field because there's actual money there, right? In the, the field I'm working in, there's none, right? Uh, but, um, and I, I am actually getting, I'm the advisor of the Creative Writing Club at BMCC, and I do have, we do have less students joining than we used to, right? Because I've been doing it a long time. I've been doing okay. it maybe 14 years, right? So I think they're more interested in screenwriting and different yeah. kinds of creativity. Yeah. Yeah. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, you have some interesting projects in the works now. Would you tell us mm -hmm. about them? Well, I'll start by talking about the novel that I'm working on, and then uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, television. But um, I am working on a novel um, about a woman who who comes from a, a working class background, um, uh, like many of our students at CUNY, and who becomes part of kind of New York um, literati scene, and um, and then at some point she becomes highly educated and then she decides to abandon all of that and kind of try to go home and and pretend to be who she once was so i think of it as like a, a reverse gatsby is, is how i thought of it and i'm working on that and i'm excited about it i'm taking a break from some television projects that i was trying to get off the ground and um i, I worked on them for so long and um and i i just need a break but i'm excited about it so i'm going to go back and I'm, I'm at the point where i'm I'm a learning writer in, in that form, and, um, but I'm working on three in that form. Um, one is about um, mixed race families in New Orleans, um, just, in, just before the Civil War, just really fascinating stories um, from, from there in the, and that are kind of emblematic of the history of this country. Um, another one is about a group of, um, of kind of functional alcoholics in, in Brooklyn. And another is about um, a, a Filipino American restaurateur and her family. So those those uh, those three. But um, and and I'm excited. I love the form, um, and I want to get back to it. But but I'll finish the novel first. Okay. I hadn't written. Well, I hadn't read uh, mm -hmm. short stories in a while. So it, it's interesting to get back to that form that mm -hmm. I started out with, and you know, find out what's happening there. Uh, but anyway, interesting, interesting discussion, interesting book. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to thank Laurel Stapleton, lecturer in the English department at the Borough of Manhattan Community College and author of The Ruin of Everything, Stories, for joining me today.
the book is published by Paloma Press. Also, to learn about our upcoming shows, be sure to follow us on Twitter at one to one CUNY TV. For the City University of New York and one to one I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Yeah.